you know, if you say, hey, I want to be, I'm from the city, I want to be a farmer. So go ahead, go ahead and buy a thousand acres of land, afford that. And then also afford the operating costs, the machinery and everything that's included. And, and so you, you write it off, you're like, oh, well, I can't do that. So I'm going to focus on going to school for X, Y, Z or whatever. So being able to introduce a sustainable model that's also achievable for the next generations of farmers is really important to get their involvement in that. Welcome to the Feast Over Famine podcast. On this podcast, we're navigating the tension that we find where mission and profit collide. We're talking to CEOs, founders, executive directors, impact investors, and all of what we've identified as the global ecosystem of the social enterprise, business for transformation, business as mission landscape. We're talking to them about the obstacles they face, the strategic challenges they've been through, how they're funded, how they were started, and everything that's happened in between. We are trying to share their story in a way that's impactful to help us all to grow the social enterprise space for the better. Enjoy this week's episode with your host, Ryan Mahaffey. All right, everyone. Welcome to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. Stoked everyone's here listening and really excited to have a project that I've known for a handful of years and seen go through some really cool seasons from their early in, invention days and uh, uh, warehouse in Sedalia, Colorado to what they're at now. Some really cool partners and just all sorts of stuff that I'm excited to catch up on too. So uh, Eric, Chris, Rick, welcome to the podcast, guys. Stoked you're here. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I can have some fun. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. Even as we were kind of preparing, you guys threw a lot of even terms at me that I, I don't even know what they are. And it took me a while to learn what a lion's mane rush, mushroom is versus some other ones. So why don't we start here? Tell us, tell me a little bit of the background of like, how did Farmbox get started? What is Farmbox? And then maybe after the basics of that, then we can go into some of the, like the technology of it and how it works. Yeah, perfect. I'll, I'll tackle that one. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, describe it at maybe like a 30,000 foot level and then any detail you awesome. want me to go into, we can uh, we can get into it. But um, basically what Farmbox Foods, what we do is we're a manufacturer of containerized farms. Uh, we use 40 foot shipping containers that are insulated and we have three different uh, models that we build out of those. Uh, one is a vertical hydroponic farm. Another is a gourmet mushroom farm. And a new farm that we're developing right now is a fodder system to feed livestock and bring food security to, to animals. So it's something that we're, uh, we're really excited about. Um, but that's actually not how we started out. Um, the first vision of this company uh, was originally to, uh, to build affordable housing and to do that inside of shipping containers. And uh, th there's a couple things um, uh, along the lines that kind of halted that and, and changed our progress from from building out containerized housing uh, to doing hydroponic farms. Uh, and one of them is understanding the difference between abundance and sustainability. Uh, Cause I think sometimes those two words get intertwined and get confused a little bit. So um, for instance, there, there's an abundance of shipping containers and those are actually not the type of con shipping containers that we use. Uh, the shipping containers that we use are insulated and those are, those are actually kind of hard to come by. Um, but there are, a lot I think of you can find a bunch of them on fire off the coast of Portugal right now, if you yeah, want. <laughs> exactly. Or, I mean, like right now with shipping, I mean, some of them are being dropped off in empty lots. Um, but these are also shipping containers that are, uh, that are not insulated. So, um, and then with sustainability in there, you know, to, to, to build out living quarters in a 40 foot shipping container, which is 320, it's a 320 square foot footprint. After you add insulation into those walls and add, you know, the living rooms that you would want, go get an apartment. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and then on top of that, it's the permitting. So, you know, a lot of communities do not just want communities of containers sitting out there, uh, you know, for the aesthetics of it. So, so permitting was an issue. So, um, so that put the brakes on the idea of affordable housing uh, for a little while. Um, but then that also introduced us to a local high school here in Colorado uh, that had a container farm. And uh, so one of our founders' daughters went to this high school and kind of said, Dad, you need to come check this out and see what they're doing. And um, so that, that's kind of how the whole project started with the introduction of, of hydroponic farming was, 
was was seeing a unit that was already put into practice there. And, um, you know, we don't want to knock it. It's a competitor's unit and they're doing something sustainable and the ocean's big enough for all of us. So um, we just saw it as an opportunity to look at this unit and, and learn about some of the inefficiencies of it and mm-hmm. do something that we feel we can build and design a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so we, we looked at this unit and, you know, one of the first things was that it was not ADA compliant, which is American Disabilities Act. Yeah. So we figured if we could build a unit that's ADA compliant, and then one of our founders actually already had, um, a design for, for grow tubes. And he was actually using these originally as a privacy break for a hot tub. <laughs> so, so being able to take those and actually put them into a commercial scale, uh, along with uh, with a software system to add automation to the unit, um, we were able to design a unit and bring it in the right team to construct an engineer. Uh, we were able to come up with a unit that the design really hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, our version 1.0 for a vertical farm is really not that much different than our version 3.0 that we're on now. Um, there's little differences as far as like electrical systems and control panels. Um, but overall, the, the layout um, was was really a success. So, so that's that's how we started, um, and it was really just by, hey, Dad, come check out this unit at our high school. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so kind of a neat story. And then after realizing, yeah, that that we could go from a, you know the, uh, an idea of affordable housing to being able to feed people, um, that was a really good feeling. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool how, you know, I think there's some of the greatest inventions in the world are this way. They're like stumbled upon, you're trying to solve one problem and then you figure out something that, that works elsewhere. So it's kind of cool. You guys have that model and, but yet you can, you can figure out kind of the impact component to change. It's not affordable housing anymore, but you've kind of shifted it and still kept that at the center of what you guys are doing, which we can, we can talk more about. Talk to me then, you know, specifically about the technology and maybe we can start with some of the basics, like what is ver- what's the difference between vertical hydroponic or um, sorry yeah yeah vertical farming uh, hydroponics aquaponics where do you guys fit let me just ba- I mean this is literally water dripping through those little pods and and I guess with you explaining that what's what's different than the rest of the industry of this kind of stuff with farm box you know so yeah so uh, I mean yeah there's a difference between uh, aquaponics and and hydroponics. Uh, what we do in our, our first original design was vertical hydroponics. So it's a vertical system where we're pumping water up, gravity feeding it down, collecting that water, and then recycling it. So creating a really sustainable ecosystem inside of a 40-foot container. Um, we have people ask all the time, you know, would you guys be willing to look at different systems or, or building out warehouses? Um, that's not really our niche right now because, you know, being able to control a 40 foot container is being able to understand the parameters that are involved in there. And if we were to look at a warehouse and say, you know, what if we're going to build out hydroponic system in here, we don't know the history of the warehouse. We don't know where the temperature is different within that warehouse, the drafts and building in the efficiencies that we know we can do that to scale in a 40 foot container. So, um, where hydroponics comes into play and let's say the difference between like hydroponics and, and aquaponics. Um, uh, you know, a big difference in that is being able to have an ROI. So it really depends on what your mission is as far as vertical farm ownership is. Um, but sometimes when you look at aquaponics or, you know, or growing a protein as well. So having, you know, growing a tilapia or minnows and creating that to fertilize the plants. That will work out well in a in a very nonprofit where, where ROI is not a top 20 item. Now, if it's a restaurant that wants to grow its own fresh produce behind the restaurant or inside of the restaurant, doing a vertical hydroponic farm can still be efficient enough to turn a profit. So, so that's 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 kind of the balancing point there. How important is profit? Are you about feeding people or are you about turning a profit overall? and also providing fresh greens. So yeah. there's a lot of different missions, a lot of different ways to utilize the units. It really just depends on who are we working with? Is it nonprofit, government, education? Are we working with the private sector or public? So there's a lot of different areas to, uh, um, and a lot of different kind of inputs uh, to look at there. 
Yeah, that's cool. And I want to transition into kind of those sectors and kind of some use cases of this and then how each one has their own individual version of impact. But before I do that, talking about the types of crops that you guys are growing, because I think that's important too. I've heard Tony, your original founder, talk about all sorts of things he wanted to grow in there versus uh, what you guys are maybe growing now and the different options you talked about, the the GMF and the fodder, like all these different versions. So talk to me about what that means. Um, and I want to expand on mushrooms because I, I think mushrooms are, they're misunderstood and uh, and really interesting. So give me the overview and then we'll dive deep on mushrooms. So uh, let's so let's start with the vertical farm uh, since we kind of started on there. So um, so on, on the vertical farm, what we're growing is a leafy grain. Uh, basically, anything that's not adding a ton of weight into the walls. Uh, we do have a new tube design uh, that's going to help integrate rooted plants like like a beet or a radish uh, or carrots. Uh, so that's something we're going to be testing out with our new design. Um, but right now, you know, the, the farms that we operate are owned by one of our partners, which is Centura Health. Okay. Um, uh, food security is very important. It's something that they're uh, wanting to improve upon. Um, and it helps the hospitals tell a story to their patients of saying, you know, we're, we're providing food that has a full nutritional value. Mm. Uh, it's not food that was shipped in from California or a thousand miles away and lost nutrient density. Um, so. A lot of the stuff we're going right now is like lettuce, like a butterhead lettuce just grows really well vertically. Uh, the hospitals like it for their cafeterias and for their hospital beds and for their salads. Um, we grow kale. Um, herbs grow really well. Basil, cilantro, uh, wasabi arugula. Um, that's one of my favorite things to grow is wasabi arugula because it's such an innocent looking plant and then you eat it and it just it loves you. It just it has that wasabi I've ever kick. Heard of wasabi arugula. That's crazy. Yeah, and it's it's delicious. And then it's it's a great additive to a salad to actually really give okay. it a flavor without you know using too much dressing. So interesting. Um, so peppers grow well. Uh, we can grow strawberries. Uh, there's certain things, you know, we have a list of probably 60 different plants that we've grown and that's not by any means all inclusive right. um, they're just plants that happen to grow really well um to grow really well together together under the same parameters um something else that we're really proud uh to do and it was just started as a test is growing trees so oh, right you know okay. where, 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 where you live at you know forest fires can be you know that that's a real scenario um so, uh, so, you know, so forest fire remediation, uh, and also, you know, what, what comes with that is soil improvements as well. So being able to grow trees in our unit, uh, is something that, uh, a lot of, in, is, is an area where you have a lot of interest coming in to, uh, to our company with. So, uh, utility companies are looking at our units to, to replace the trees that they're cutting. Um, for instance, Interesting. yeah. So, you know, where you're at up there, I think it is core. Or it used to be probably yeah. IREA. Yeah, IREA um, core. Yeah. Yeah. So so they own like five thousand miles of power lines between like the Bailey area and I think down like Woodland Park. I think that's kind of the yeah. reach. And I'm praying right now that one of them doesn't go down while we're recording this podcast because the snowstorm <laughs> yeah. outside. Because <laughs> what it does, I don't get internet for days on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like our vertical farm, you know, one one farm can grow about thirty five thousand trees a year, and wow. um, and and that's. And here's the other thing that you'll hear about, like in carbon credits, right? And I, and I hear you hear all the time is grain washing. Um, that's 35,000 trees is that's the amount of slots that we could fit. So if we had zero loss and if every tree and every seedling took hold, it'd be about 35,000 trees per year per unit. Okay. But you also want to be careful on that. You know, not every seed's going to make it, not every tree tree's going to, you know, grow to fruition. So, so that's the number of, that's how many spots that you could have, you know, then realistically you'd want to have a, a parameter of failure on there. So well, I call it, I mean, there's a project that I'm working on that you guys are, are familiar with. I won't talk about on here, but we, we basically built the model out and it looked so good and so profitable, which is something I want to talk about with you guys that I, I literally, I've never done this before. I, at the top of the financial model, I just added a BS meter. And I was like, let's just assume it's not this good on top of the failure rate on top. And I just, it's like, I'm just going to drop like a 30% BS meter in to say that we just, it's nowhere near as good as we think it's going to be. And let's base yeah. our investment offering off that, which is wise to be conservative. And I was like, man, this is even with the failure rates built in, this is highly successful and profitable and 
Awesome. <laughs> you should make that BS meter a little button on Excel. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so after you build a spreadsheet, so like, well, let's let's hit the BS meter and put a little bit of failure in there. There's awesome. some artificial <laughs> intelligence <laughs> yeah. robot that looks at your spreadsheet. And they're like, yeah, no, there's a BS meter here. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Funny. That's so, awesome. um, and then you also want to talk about uh, about the mushrooms. Yeah. Um, so the mushroom unit is a complete separate farm. That's really model number two. Uh, of what we created uh that farm is as of now is my favorite farm because mushrooms don't care they grow and um <laughs> and as long as you create the correct parameters uh they they're not finicky they, they like to get big quickly so our our original we're on version you know probably 3.0 right now for the mushroom farm we're operating version 1.0 in sedalia um, and that's where we built these original units. We now have manufacturing, um, a separate manufacturing facility. But, um, but that version 1.0, uh, right now, if we were to run that to full capacity, we'd be looking over 500 pounds of mushrooms a week. And that's wow. a gourmet, that's a gourmet variety. So, yeah. And give me, uh, just, just run some rough numbers for me. Like what, and we did this and that you don't have to, you can be kind of conservative or just kind of average. No one's going to hold you against these. So 500 pounds a week, that's let's just say times four, it could produce 2000 pounds of mushrooms a month. Right. Correct. What would those, what was it? Just looking at this as a business model, if someone were to buy one of these units from you guys and do that, what are the, what are the mushrooms retailing at? I know there's like so a few we'll, different types. So let's, let's start high and we'll go low. So for instance, we have a unit in Tahiti. And it's the only mushroom production on the island. So every mushroom, every all the mushrooms that the restaurants and the residents are buying are yeah. being imported in. And mushrooms do not have a, a long shelf life, okay. especially if, if they're fresh. If you flash freeze them, you can add the life to it. But, um, but the quality is going to drop. So this guy over there is selling mushrooms in Tahiti for 40 to 50 bucks a pound. He's, he's growing money. And it, so it's he's absolutely... literally, so let's just do the math here. I mean, he's 2000 pounds a month times you said 40 to 50, just let's say 45, so say 45 bucks a pound. Yeah. He's like 90 grand a month in revenue. And yeah. uh, what's the, I mean, it's, it, I, it's not counting it costing anywhere near that to make those or right. To... No, I mean, you know, we look at, the average cost, like a substrate it, 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 to, when you have that, 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 that bag that the mushroom grows out. And I'm trying to keep it in simple terms for, yeah, uh, for the yeah. podcast, but you, so our unit, it's, it's the full process. You create the bag of substrate after you create that substrate. And that includes the, um, uh, the protein, the fiber, the unicorn bag that it, that it grows inside of. And then the grain spawn, the average cost is about $2 and 10 cents for an eight pound bag. And out of that, um, it grows about two and a half to three pounds of mushrooms per block. Yeah. We don't have to do the full math, but a very good margin in that scenario, which is cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and now, yeah. now that's top of the food chain, right? Like the, 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 yeah. the markets and probably 99% of the world would not, would not support that. Right. Um, but when we're at here, like in Denver, um, you know, an, an honest farmer's market price for like a blue oyster or a king trumpet is about fifteen dollars a pound, so it's yeah. still a great profit. You right. know, that's still looking right. at about two dollars and ten cents uh, on average for for the cost going into that bag. Yeah. That, that's yeah, excluding Eric. labor. Eric, you're looking at about twenty four thousand yeah. dollars a month at at just a conservative twelve dollars a pound. Yeah. Yeah. So you subtract you subtract your cost of growth at about a thousand, give or take. Yeah. And, you know your labor, uh, then your water and electrical, which is fairly low. Um, yeah. You're profiting considerable. Yeah. So so mushroom. That's why I love the mushroom box. It's just an absolute money maker. And yeah. And, you know, farmers markets are probably going to get your top dollar here in the U.S. And then if you work, you know, if you sell directly to the restaurants. Uh, but then also that's including more labor. So, you know, that's you driving around delivering yeah. there. Then the next step is just going to a distributor. So, you know, distributors are probably around nine to $10 a pound. So it's still great profit. And, um, and like I said, you know, like, like the vertical farm and really all of our farms, all three models. Uh, and it's, it's really important to set the expectations, right. 
they do require labor. I mean, it is a living organism inside of there. Yeah. Um, you know, our vertical farm, something can go wrong quickly. Um, that's what's nice about having an automated system is that it, is that you can figure it out. But mm. you know, the mushroom farm, like a mister might not turn on for a day. We haven't had that issue. But if it doesn't turn on for the day, mushrooms don't care. <laughs> you guys need a t-shirt. It's like farm box foods. Mushrooms don't care. They yeah. just make money or something <laughs> yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so no, it's really, uh, so the, the mushroom cool. box is, is really unique. And, and that was, you know, we, we have patents on certain items in the, in, in the vertical farm. And there's other, there's other companies out there that build vertical hydroponic farms. Um, but we're the only, we were the first one to offer a menu of both vertical and a mushroom farm. And wow. now we have our new, our new baby under, under progress right now, which is our fodder system. Okay. So g- give me, before we talk about fodder, just so I don't forget, like, give me a, what are, what are these costs? Like, so obviously we're saying, wow, this is a business model. That's pretty awesome. Why don't you guys just go create a hundred of them and make money off of it? But you're also, you're actually selling these units. So we, we, we say budget for 200,000. Okay. And, and, yep. and that's a pretty honest figure. Um, you know, just because with, uh, you know, depending on deploy training and freight, you know, those are, those are variables on average budget for, for about $200,000 for farm ownership. Yeah. And, um, and that is an all in price. So yeah. that would be the shipping deployment, which is our group working with uh, contractors or individuals, yeah. making sure that the site is prepped um, and then training which will be pre um, and then during and then also post. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an all inclusive price. Yeah. Which the ROI on that isn't too crazy then if we're talking about these mar these kinds of margins, we're just talking about, it's what, probably a three to, I mean, I don't know the math in front of me, probably a three to six year maximum ROI. No, no, actually it's about a 12 to 14 month on the mushroom farm and about two years on a vertical farm. And that does not include labor. That's for operational costs right there. So labor is, Yeah. Cool. Awesome. No, that's super helpful. Okay. So then talk, talk about the fodder fodder model here, and then we'll get into some of the other stuff. Yeah. So I'll take that one. Uh, this is Chris. I'm the PR director for farm box foods. So we are, we're still in the development phase of our fodder farm and, and basically fodder is a nutrient rich hay. It's a protein rich hay. That's a dietary supplement for livestock. So cattle, horses, sheep, goats, chickens, uh, you name it. There, there's uh, quite a few uses for this. Uh, and, and we had been talking about uh, creating one of these when we got an email from a gentleman named Joaquin Gonzalez, and he's lived in the States for about two years or so, but he grew up in Chile, and he worked with the Chilean government uh, because they were having issues with drought out there. So the northern part of the country wasn't getting any rain. The southern part was getting a significant amount of rain, and they were having livestock die uh, in the northern part of the country. So they tried to basically you know, engineer some solutions to that. And so they, they brought Joaquin on board and he's, he's a quadruple threat, if not a quintuple th- threat, really smart guy, a uh, really hard worker, but basically he built a, a hydroponic fodder farm that was able to generate about a thousand pounds worth of, of fodder every day. And so the, the big, the big benefit obviously of container farming is, is being able to bring that to the animals. So the drought was no longer a factor. These things use about 50 to 60 gallons of water a day, which isn't that bad when you're considering how much it's producing. A thousand pounds a day is, is pretty impressive. Um, so just to give you an idea, the number of horses that it feeds per day, again, as a dietary supplement, is about 30 to 35 horses. Uh, beef cattle, about 35 to 40 head of cattle. And what it does is it, it ups the weight of the livestock. So it's, it's part of their finishing diet. Um, it promotes the production of better quality milk uh, for dairy cows and goats. Huh. Um, and because uh, it, it has a bunch of uh, water in it as well, so it actually hydrates the animals. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, but because, because it's so nutritious and because it's so protein rich, they're able to digest it a lot easier than traditional hay. So it's about 85% digestibility, which means it reduces methane output, uh, which, is, which is a big deal going forward. There's a lot of people talking about how do we attempt to cap the methane that's coming out of these farms? And, and this is one way of doing that. Uh, we've seen numbers that are anyway, anywhere between 20% and 50%, uh, depending on the animal. But because of that digestibility, not putting out that methane is, is a huge benefit. And that's wow. aside from being able to grow on site year round. 
uh, for these farmers and ranchers. Uh, over the last two years, the, the pandemic has made uh, the, the price of hay just skyrocket. So it's really attractive for uh, farmers and ranchers to basically control their own production. Uh, they don't have to worry about any of the external factors like drought, as I mentioned. Uh, they don't have to worry about pests. They don't have to worry about freezes or heat waves. Uh, you know, there's so many different factors that are taken out of the equation when you're talking about farming in a container. Uh, and, and plus the animals love it. We actually took some fodder out uh, for a test munch uh, last week to a friend's ranch and, and the <laughs> test <smudge>. munch. <laughs> oh, I'm going to start munch. using that. When I introduce a new food to my two and a half year old, I'm going to hey, you know, <laughs> do a munch. test munch. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and they weren't quite sure what to think of it because basically it's, it's spring fresh grass is what they're eating. And it was weird for them to see that in the middle of winter here in Colorado, but yeah. it, it, it only took them a few minutes of a little bit of sniffing around and they were all wow. over it. And, and pretty soon all that fodder was gone. Uh, and so we gave it to a couple of head of cattle and a couple of goats out there. And it, it was uh, very well received. So, cool. Uh, cool. you know, we feel like this one's just going to uh, really take off because, uh, you know, during during a disaster, for example, humans eat first when that happens. The supply chain shuts down and the humans eat first. So so having a, a sustainable source of, of nutrient rich food there on site uh, kind of takes that fear and uncertainty out of the equation for those farmers and ranchers. Yeah. Well, and they're, they're buying it somewhere. They're going to be buying some sort of hay or something for their livestock and having it delivered or picking it up and whatever. So really it's not, I mean, the cool thing about most of the, the business cases for this is they're, they're already have some sort of output cost to access this kind of food, right? right. You guys yeah. are offering it in a more sustainable way, probably a more delicious, healthier way, more nutrient rich way for maybe upfront a, a higher cost, but in the long run, actually even a better ROI. So if people can kind of get over that initial investment, it actually, it's it's kind of one of those win, 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 win all around things that that really works well. And I, and I want to talk about some of the business cases on it. Um, I mean, we could have a whole podcast episode on just that fodder stuff. I'm really interested. I, I want to go deeper yeah. on the methane gases and how that works and all this crazy stuff. How do you guys, the leadership team, like, balance the impact component. So even just with everything you guys have said from caring about the methane gases, just caring about what animals eat. I mean, most people just grab a cow and they could care less buying ground beef at the grocery store, right? Um, to caring about food insecurity and censure. I mean, this there's probably a list of a hundred different impactful things on the community that could happen as a result of your product. How, how are you guys balancing like where you're focusing your impact energy? Is it, okay, we're just going to see who comes to us and naturally that's going to be the case. Are you guys targeting specific verticals? Yeah. How, how are you guys managing that? I think it's funny that you use the word balancing and focused. Um, <laughs> so we're drinking from a fire hose, yeah. um, you know, and, and that's what we really realized is that we, we developed a, a, a product that can go across so many different industries. Um, and so growing organically, you know, without investors, uh, you know, so far, um, mm has been has been that's been the balance of when do we bring on the next person when do we bring on the next sales rep or you know or focus on we kind of broken into swim lanes uh part of that is due to, to rick walker's swim coaching history uh so <laughs> we we have industries broken down into our swim lanes one might be 501c3 nonprofit government private uh public sector restaurants okay. hospitality so um, so trying to, you know, put focus on those on um, in balance within those areas has, um, has been a test, um, but mm. it's also been a test of our team. Um, something that makes our team extremely unique is that we have the institutional knowledge. So, uh, Ryan, you, you know, you mentioned Jason Brown, he's still with us. You know, he built the original units. Uh, one of the other fabricators actually just walked by the window here in the office so everyone that's built the original units, we understand how those work and all the tests, all the errors and the successes that we've had. So, yeah. so that definitely helps us be able to navigate these different industries with success. Um, I mean, so far we've touched, you know, we're, we're, we're involved in, in, in the oil and gas industry. Um, that's something that wasn't on the table when we first started developing these units. You know, at first we're thinking, well, these are going to be really popular. Every restaurant's going to want one of these behind their behind their location. Right. I think restaurants will probably end up being two percent of our business overall. It's going to be the nonprofits. 
it'll be government sector, it'll be the uh, it'll be educational systems. So yeah, um, well, and, and so part of I guess this is a question. Part of it could be that's just the best vertical because it's the best conversion ratio and the best thing to do. And it just so happens nonprofits and government and the people having impact are just the best vertical for you guys. Other scenarios, you could choose that. It could be that restaurants would be the best one, but you know, it's just as 90% effective to go after the nonprofit. So the, how does that play into where you guys choose those swim lanes? Are you guys looking at and saying, all right, well, we can make X amount of money here and it's kind of an impact or X money here a little less money, but more impact. Has that played a role in you guys' strategic decisions of that? It, it, it has to a degree. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, one, one of our, one of the company's philosophies is that if we are uh, accomplishing a solution for a group or an entity, then we'll be successful. But mm -hmm. making a profit isn't our driving force. I mean, every company has to make a profit in order yeah, to totally. exist. But if we keep the vision in front of us, then everything else will fall in its place. So that being said, you know, we're, we've been a catalyst to bringing groups together. We've been, um, you know, we've been able to help, um, you know, a group that comes in and says they want to do this. We focused in on what their priorities are rather than our priorities to sell. And, and that's that's vital that that's something that's probably lacking in our market and you know i so i think that you know when you've got that well rusty uh the ceo rusty walker um would would say it best if if we're going to create sales then we better darn well create a relationship and that's a relationship that we're going to follow mm -hmm. long after that farm has been placed long after they've grown because we're in it to win it with them. We're not calling them or, you know, selling a farm. So we win. So by that, you know, with that in mind, um, we're helping everybody else be successful. So in return, we've got a bunch of people helping us be successful. I don't, I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. But. No, that's super cool. I, and I love that philosophy that just by the nature of doing it and doing it right, there's going to be this impact that permeates. Like if every company in the world was that way, we'd be in a lot better spot, you know? And not to say that companies are evil in nature by not being that way. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense, you know? It's, it's just, different it's just priority. Like, yeah, right. Correct. I, I think one of the most rewarding things about being part of Farmbox is that it introduces you to good people because good people want to feed other people. You yeah. don't see too many bad <laughs> people. And yeah. I always like to say, you don't see bad people like, I want to feed people. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you don't come across that. What you yeah. do is you come across people and you come across organizations that are mission-based. And, you know, and they want to make the world, you know, 2% better if they can. Yeah. And then yeah. they want to start that process and they want to hand that off to somebody else to get that to 4% better. So, yep. um, so we work with a lot of, you know, amazing individuals and, uh, and, and organizations that, that we want to associate ourselves with, um, yeah. you know, when, when cool. it comes to selling our farm, that's the thing is you're buying a 10, 15 year relationship from us. You know, we're, we're going to yeah. be a part of that process you know, uh, down the road. So yeah. And is it a good fit yeah. for both parties? Is it a good fit for both farm box and the entity? And, and we've found that, you know, we've been able to be, you know, somewhat selective with the people that we've been, that been partnering with. I think a good example of that, uh, Centura health, they were our very first customer and, and they kind of saw the vision. They, they got what we were trying to do. They have this mission of, of feeding the communities that they serve. So not just the, the patients that are coming into the hospital, but the entire community itself, which is, mm -hmm. is really admirable. And this is something that, that's really taking off nationwide, these food security missions. So, uh, you know, partnering up with somebody like that, that sees the vision that has kind of that multi-pronged benefit. Uh, so being able to feed the community, but they're also uh, with one of their units that they bought from us, they're using it as a workforce development center. So passing along that skill set to the next generation of urban farmers to do more with less and using science and tech to, to make that happen. Yeah, totally. No, I, I love that. Well, and it's, I mean, it, it's at a base level, you guys hit on food security, you hit on nutrition, 
you hit, like, I mean, there's just so many, you hit on environmental sustainability and what's needed on that. And I, and I think like those alone, just by someone using your unit, if that's, if that's, it's like, what anytime I put on my Patagonia jacket, I'm like, I know that the profits from that went to impact in the economy and it was sourced properly and raw material. And, and it's a simple thing, but it's just a, it's a great model. And I think it's, it's really impactful. All right, everyone, I want to take a quick break from today's episode and just share a little bit about Impact Foundation, who's got an incredibly awesome model of using impact investment, charitable dollars, and funding tons of projects all over the world right now. What if your investments could change the world? At Impact Foundation, they believe business with purpose has the power to transform society. Purpose built for impact investing, Impact Foundation provides a streamlined way to fund businesses that seek social and spiritual transformation or make loans to charity, all while earning a financial return to grow your giving. Donors and investors have already supported more than 200 redemptive enterprises through their impact accounts. They provide needed fuel for companies that exist as a force of God's redemptive work in the world. To learn more about what they're doing in their kingdom impact investing model, visit impactfoundation.org. Shifting gears a little, and I and I think we can maybe the cool way to talk about this is to kind of talk about the business case and the impact case. Um, you guys listed off a handful of sectors and and projects you've done: oil and gas to zoos to carbon credits, ESG, GSSM, Centura, the Tahiti Islands. I mean, all sorts of things. Why don't we Why don't we pick maybe like as, as we kind of finish off here, like two or three of those, um, and just talk through what that was, why it was a good business case for them. And, um, and then what the impacts component is. And I think it'll actually show people just how diverse it is when people come to you and, and, and look at that. Yeah. Uh, Rick, would you maybe want to talk about GSSM and how they're basically going to just use it as a toy? <laughs> sure. Sure. Oh, cool. um, so um, we, we've sold a farm that's uh, in production right now. Uh, that's going to a university um, out in the east in uh, South Carolina. And um, so it's a, a science and math university predominantly. And so what they want to do is they want to bring the farm in. They want to do some research in it. They want to, you know, tinker around with it, do some testing. Um, they want to test seeds, um, you know, being able to create for example, if, if you're crossbreeding seeds and you want to know if it'll grow in a certain region, well, you can set the temperature for that region in the farm and test it out to see if it's going to grow before mm -hmm. you do a massive production um, or what kind of a seed would grow in that. And, and so on the, on the other side is, you know, working on the seed. So, um, you know, that's that's one of their um, thoughts and ideas, and, and also exposing them to challenging uh, situations because the farm was designed for um, education, for employment. I mean, we could have used robotics, um, but that would take away the employment element. So this is, exposes all educational institutions, for example, high schools, being able to incorporate an entire curriculum all the way down to, uh, you know, shop. So the shop students could be, you know, come in and make, uh, maintenance the farm, um, accounting, business management, all of that could run a business out of that farm. And then those students actually would have that to be able to put on their uh, college applications, which is fairly rare nowadays for a college student to be able to say, I ran a business. Yeah, that's uh, super cool. You know, so the university is using it for science uh, as well as producing foods for their uh, their cafeterias. What a cool model. Um, and, I, and I think that's been something that's permeated since even when I first met Tony uh, three or four years ago now was just he, he cares a lot. He cared a lot, cares a lot. I think he still does. And you guys do too, education, like, right, like. Oh, let's educate the next generation on what this stuff looks like. Let's get them interested in STEM. And it just seems like that's just a route that's kind of stayed and penetrated into what you guys do. Well, th I mean, if you think about it with, with hydroponics and what we do, it's we're having to do more with less resources. You know, look, yeah. look at the drought, look at the water levels. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's terrifying actually what's happen happening with water. 
And um, like Ryan, like you might know, I mean, so, so Colorado and Hawaii, those are the only two headwater states in the United States. So that means those are the only, we're the only two states that produce our own water. So we might be thinking, well, cool, I live in Colorado, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, that's not what that means at all. You know, yeah. there's compacts out there. There's senior, junior, subcompacts. And, mm-hmm. and one of the oldest ones is with Mexico. And if they say, hey, send us water, we have to send them water. And that means we're cutting off our subcompacts, our junior compacts to send water on down. So, wow. you know, the educational aspect of this could not be more important. Um, because moving forward, you know, a big thing with agriculture is that a lot of people think it's unattainable. Um, you know, if you say, Hey, I want to be, I'm from the city. I want to be a farmer. So go ahead, go ahead and buy a thousand acres of land, afford that. And then also afford the operating costs, the machinery, everything that's included. And and so you you write it off. You're like, Oh, well, I can't do that. So I'm going to focus on going to school for X, Y, Z or whatever. So being able to introduce a sustainable model that's also achievable for the next generations of farmers is really important to get their involvement in that. When we were at the National Western Stock Show, um, we had a unit there uh, right up front. It was uh, one of the units that Centura uh, Hospital owns, uh, Centura Health. Um, It was the only unit we ever built where we put a window in it. Normally we don't do that because that messes with the R value. Um, but, but we did it was their, their farm. They wanted a unit and it ended up being something that we absolutely loved because you would watch the younger kids walk past that unit and look inside, especially when it was dark outside and then the light on the inside, there were like moths going to a light and they were so excited. They're like, look at that. That's, that's, that's vertical farming. A lot of them already knew some of the basic terminology, yeah. but just to see their excitement and, and, and it was something, it was so refreshing to be like, okay, we're a part of that. And, and, and it was really a, a sense of pride uh, that yeah. we took when we saw that. But well, that's the it's, thing now. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, we have to invest in the future of that, both the individuals in our society who understand it, right? As that's like a dying career in some ways. But, you know, like I, I, invested, in, I invest in Tesla and I have investment in John Deere because- T- technology, all this stuff might go crazy. P- like the world population, I forget the number, but the world population is going to grow by like X percent in the next 20, 30 years. We're going to need to act like machinery <laughs> to like grow food. And so like as an investment in that, I mean, it's just, it's a stable solid. It might not be sexy. It might not be the coolest thing, but it's going to be there. It's going to be a need. Humans need to eat. And so I think taking a priority to coach the next generation, get them excited about that, get them interested in it and to do it in a way that that makes sense. I mean, maybe picking up a combine and driving it through the fields isn't the version of that, but maybe owning some of these farms and getting them in the right communities and the right ways is, and that's the way of the future. And so I, th- I think you guys' heart for that is actually really cool and, and needed and much bigger than just us, any of us on this call right now. I think that technology provides that open door to them too. They see the ability to use technology, which obviously the younger generations are are very familiar with and comfortable with and using that technology to actually solve a concrete problem. Mm. I think they they love the possibility of being able to do that. And then they see, you know, there are a lot of companies that are jumping on board on the sustainability train uh, and seeing those companies actually acknowledge the problem and put money towards doing something about it. I think it's also attractive these kids that are growing up today, they want to change the world and they just need a mechanism to be able to do that. Um, And when we talk about sustainability, I think one of the most important things that we haven't really touched on all that much, and maybe uh, Eric alluded to it a little bit earlier is we're reducing, if not eliminating food miles. So that basically means instead of trucking lettuce all the way from California to the East coast, you're growing near the consumer, which means you're no longer using fossil fuels to get it there. Uh, the, the vegetables aren't spending four, five, six days in a distribution center and on a truck and losing their shelf life. Uh, the, the veggies have their entire nutritional value. So that reduces the amount of food waste. Uh, there's just so many benefits to growing near the consumer. And I, I think more and more people are realizing that a good example yeah. is uh, natural grocers here in Colorado. They, they have a growing operation using one of our vertical hydroponic farms right behind one of their stores wow. here in Lakewood. And that means they're growing the lettuce 80 steps away. It's about as fresh as fresh gets. So it's, wow. it's a good, it's a good PR move. It, it saves the environment. It saves on costs for transportation. 
there's just so many different benefits to it that I, I think people really get that. And kind of circling back around, I think the kids are seeing that and saying, hey, maybe maybe I can do something about this issue. It just takes yeah. a little bit of ingenuity to, to solve it. Ryan, yeah. you, you brought up uh, investing, and, and I just wanted to touch on, on that just a little bit. Um, you know, so if, if you're a, a foundation or a community service group and you want to go out and do a fundraiser to get one of the farms, uh, this is one of those things that people can get really excited about backing financially because yeah. it's, it's a result. It's a tangible result that they'll actually see rather than investing in somebody's time or a program or, you know, this will actually have an impact on that community. Mm -hmm. Plus, we've uh, developed a, a, a policy or not a policy, but a procedure called Farm It Forward. So. If you invest in one farm and then take some of the proceeds and start putting it towards another farm, then you pay off another farm. And so for the one investment of one farm, that begets another, which begets another, which mm. begets another. So in time, you're not having just a, a, an impact. You're, cool. you're decidedly um, making a shift within a community, which gives actually more power to that community because they control their food mm. source. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that. One of my questions is going to be, how do people like what funding is out there to access this? And we don't have to go super deep on that, but you know, and, and cause not, there's probably a lot of people that are going to hear this. They're like, I want to do this, but wow, 200 K do I have to go get investors? Do I have to go get this? And so my, we can talk about that, but my hope is that over time, different local government, like local government agencies and things say, Hey, we've got some grant money that we can do. And then you guys are winning because there's grant money out there and then it's just being awarded. And then you're producing and selling the units, but then organizations that are going to do good with it. Now, I, hopefully it's not totally free because it's good for people. I don't, the downside would be people don't have any skin in the game. And then these units sit empty all around the country True. that they use for a year or two, where there's someone has to kind of put their money where their mouth is and kind of go in on it, then they're going to use it and be successful. So there's a balance there. Um, but yeah, Rick, I'm with you. I think there's some creative funding models for this. The, 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 yeah, there, there definitely are. And I mean, obviously there's financial institutions, right? Like take out X amount of money, pay so much yep. back in interest and, and there you go. But, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, Biden's infrastructure right now, build back better. Um, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of money available out there. Um, it kind of how you mentioned earlier in the program, Ryan, like about, you know, how do you focus and, you know, and, and, and how do you organize in certain areas? There's, it's, there's, there's so many different ways. There's different loans. There's different grants that you can qualify for. Um, there, there's even a grant that's out there that is, that's utilized through your local utility company through the USDA. So you can go down rabbit holes for, days and weeks on the internet of, of how to raise money, but it's, you know, what do you qualify for? Do you have a past business? Is this a new business enterprise? What type of egg credits? So there's, there's, there are a, there, there are a ton of different ways. Um, you know, another mm -hmm. different, another way to do it as well as like for, for schools or for nonprofits is to have families actually sponsor the tubes inside of the units. So, you know, the Jones oh, family wow, cool. sponsor five tubes for $200 a month. Uh, or, or, or whatever price you set, that's yeah. a great way to either help cover the unit or to help help cover the ongoing operating costs of the unit. But um, but yeah, it's there's so many rabbit holes to go down to uh, yeah. government, you know, of of, of USDA of, of loans and grants. Yeah, no, it's 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 a cool. Yeah, I'm I'm intrigued and curious to see how that part pans out for you guys for sure. So I, I guess kind of a, a closing, kind of in closing, kind of not, but. Um, why don't you hit me with one more use case? Cause that, you guys listed off a bunch of them when you're thinking about it, you guys are super excited. We've only touched on natural grocery essential. I'm going to touch on a handful, but pick one more of the fun use cases that you guys have been able to tackle. That's had some cool impact and, and share it. Can I steal it? Eric, it is, it? Eric it is buzzer it's, fastest. It's, it's one that it's, it's quite the paradigm shift from what we do. You know, we, 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 you know, we're focused on sustainability and growing green plants um, and then there's the oil and gas industry. And uh, so it's like, well, how do, how do those two party together? And we, we, mm. we party well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, oil and gas, they have their ESG divisions, environmental safety governance. 
Yeah. And it's, 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 you know, a lot of that is PR. How do we soften the image of oil and gas? And, and um, so our units, you can actually operate them off of excess flare gas. So oh. by, by hooking them up to a generator. Um, oh, know, wow. There's a generator, and this is a name brand. It's called a capstone. There's a bunch of different name brands, but I just, that's just one from I'm familiar with. So you can hook a capstone generator up to flare gas and operate our units. Um, this is great because in oil and gas, you can't just flare off more gas just to produce more. You have to stay within certain parameters. So it helps the oil and gas industry by capturing that gas, put it to something useful, and then allows you to up your production and, and, and have that increase. What it also allows you to do is to go to the community and say, look, it, we are going to be drilling here. You're going to see our trucks on the highway. Um, our employees are going to be in town here. We're also going to fill up your food bank with, with, with food. How cool is that? Wow. Yeah. Um, something Ryan, that we're look- oh, go ahead, Rick. Well, that, and tell them where that, uh, that food is going. So, yeah, so, so the food can be going anywhere. I mean, it can be going to, to the local food banks, to schools. Um, something that is really neat now is with our fodder system. And then you think where you see a lot of oil and gas production, what's walking around out there? Cows. Mm-hmm. Farmers, livestock, <laughs> cows. So yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great way to also provide local feed for those, for those cows year round yeah. while capturing flare gas. So helping the oil and gas produce more and then also stay more green at the same time. So it's really wow. something that it's, that's where I see a, a huge, a big shift uh, coming soon for us is uh, we already do have a unit up in North Dakota. Um, we have a couple of uh, units that we're looking at probably putting down in, uh, in the Permian Basin down in Texas and okay. uh, um, you know, all kind of on the radar. So oil and gas is something that, um, that we never expected originally. Then we're like, wow, that's a great industry to actually be in for, uh, uh, for hydroponics. It's wild. Go ahead, Rick. Well, that, that food in uh, North Dakota is going to a reservation. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's, wow. it's owned Man. and operated by, by uh, nat- natives up there, indigenous people. Yeah. So, yeah. These swim lanes get pretty complex. I mean, it's because it's, there's an education component you guys got to fit in. Like you have to, you have to get the oil and gas companies thinking through all those loops before it, it's, it's an easy purchase, but it's also like you guys have to be a thought leader in the space and let them catch up to you before the sales happens. And that's sometimes that's a really tough business model to be from a sales cycle standpoint, that can be tough, but it's the right thing to do long-term. And if you can wait it out long enough, then there's a lot of opportunity on the other end of it. Well, in terms of, in swimming terms, uh, you know, if you don't do the lanes very well, you drown. So hmm. we, we work each and every day um, at, at being really good at it. And, and that way we keep our head above water. These use cases, I mean, they're, they're proof of concept for us. So what applications do these farms have in this certain hmm. industry? How can we, how can we optimize that? You know, we're, we're kind of still at the beginning uh, even though we've been around for four, four and a half years, we're just scratching the surface on applications. Yeah. So people come to us with new ideas every week and, and we're like, well, we haven't explored that yet, but we don't want to get, uh, as our CEO, Rusty says, we don't want to get up over the tips of our skis. So uh, <laughs> being very intentional and very purposeful as we're building out those proof of concept and, and use cases. How many containers have you guys produced and deployed at this point, whether they've been paid units or free units or anything in between? I think we're at about 25, Rick. Yeah, with, um, what is it, about 12 of them in the queue? Yeah, and so, you know, with, with being around for four years, you know, the first thing, it's always it's always hard to sell those initial units because, like, well, can, what about a testimonial? We don't, we don't have it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, no, so I mean, it's any else, business it's like model anything. at the it's, beginning. It's, it, 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 it's selling the product and, and so, you know, in, in, in your team to convince them that you have service behind it. So, you know, now that these are out there, um, it, the easier and easier it is uh, to, for, for that to follow. So, um, you know, breaking into schools was, was tough. Now we're, now we're there. So we have that momentum in that lane. So, um, so yeah, you know, we have 25 right now, but I mean, I, I think we can get to 200 by the end of the year. Yeah, Ryan, it's awesome. Ryan, let me give you one more case study. I'll be real quick. Um, if, if you can imagine the hurricanes that have hit, you know, through the Gulf, uh, Louisiana, Texas, and, and so on. And, you know, if our farms had been placed there in those communities, when the food chain breaks down, that food would still be growing. 
and would be available to the communities um, long, you know, during, after um, the hurricane hits. Um, they can be shipped there and then shipped back to the other location where they're dispersed among the communities. So FEMA would be, you know, a, a prime target to be able to supply that food during yeah. disasters when food chains and, and so on, um, you know, break down. It's going to be a long time before they're back up and running. Uh, but we should not have any community without sustainable food. You'd have yeah. greens, mushrooms, meats in a cooler and water um, and, and put your package together and you've got sustainability. Hmm. Yeah, that's all. And I picture one of the, I mean, put one of these containers on the back of like a flatbed truck and have one some disaster relief organization just Absolutely. drive 10 of them around when one of those happens and set up Absolutely. shop and now over a two to eight week time frame that they might be there as an, as a, community is recovering from something like that they're producing 500 pounds of mushrooms a week you know and they can uh, be off grid on a generator exactly yeah and now are you guys using solar on the, on the units yet or no we, we can you know and it, it, it's it is something that uh to go off grid is um uh, is is fairly easy to do um it just depends on, upon the client so we, we've had individuals ask that say hey you know i'd like to go solar by one unit your ROI just increased quite a bit. You know, just the cost of okay. solar to power one unit could add sixty to seventy thousand. So now, if your mission is to feed people, ROI is not top twenty. Absolutely, go off grid, hook, hook it to solar, and go. So yeah. solar is definitely a great option for it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just kind of curious what that would look like and all that. Well, guys, it's awesome. I mean, like I said, interacting with you guys kind of at the beginning to now, and and seeing all the use. I mean, from. I think you guys just had one unit then <laughs> as what you guys are working on. And Jason might've been building one by hand on his own in the, in the corner, but uh, to see where you guys are at now and to see the future of it and all the use cases, it's pretty cool. And it's always good to see for profit organizations that are seeking profit, but have a natural impact component as well. And yeah, super stoked for you guys. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to be on and tell more of your story. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Ryan. All right, everyone, thank you for listening to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We are so thankful you guys are here and listening. As always, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, we would love to keep you guys up to date on new episodes that are coming out when we're launching new episodes and we're launching new seasons uh, and everything in between. So uh, when we're in season, episodes are dropping every single Wednesday. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you're up to date. Also, uh, if you're loving what we're doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, where we're constantly posting about our projects, what they're doing, uh, what kinds of things we're working on. We'll recycle some uh, podcasts, uh, things about our partners, all sorts of fun stuff that you want to see. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff and check out what we're doing there. And yeah, we're stoked that you guys are listening. We hope this has been really fruitful and we will catch you guys next week. And lastly, uh, as you guys all know, we always talk about all sorts of things with impact investing, uh, investment opportunities, entity structure modeling, how projects are getting capital. And as a disclaimer and a reminder, Feast Over Famine does not provide legal tax accounting or other professional advice. You should consult professional advisors concerning the legal tax or accounting consequences of any activities related to your project or a project you're supporting. Feast Over Famine doesn't consult, advise, or assist with the offer or sale of securities in any capital raising transaction. We don't do that for the direct or indirect promotion or maintenance of a market for any securities. Uh, and Feast Over Famine does not engage in any activities for which an investment advisor's registration or license is required under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940 or under any other applicable federal or federal, federal or state law or for which a broker's or dealer's registration or license is required under the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or under any other applicable federal or state law. So there's your investment disclaimer. Uh, hopefully that's helpful if you need it. And if you ever have any questions on that side of things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care.